uh, engineer here in SoftServe. And uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, MVC uh, in Unity and uh, we'll try to answer uh, the question if uh, it's possible to bring order to the world of chaos, which Unity is. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, I have uh, this presentation divided into uh, several parts, but uh, I would like to uh, skip uh, Unity overview and uh, software design for brevi brevity sake of this uh, pre presentation, and I will go straight to the architectures. So uh, now let's uh, look at architectures. A software architecture is uh, the fundamental organization of uh, all of its parts. We'll see that uh, architectures are built uh, on top of uh, design print principles and patterns. Benefits uh, include that uh, these are proven solutions to uh, repeatable problems. By organizing our project, uh, in a bespoke way, uh, we can bring confidence, uh, scalability, performance, and uh, more to our projects. Software architectures are typically high level and uh, could be applied to various languages or platforms. And uh, also by using them, we can have faster development as well as easier time in the maintenance phases of our projects. Now, while we often think as developers that our job is uh, adding new features and that's uh, the majority of our experience, research shows that 80% of, of the time on a software project is maintaining the code. So by making choices for architectures, design principles and patterns uh, upfront and uh, applying them throughout our project, when we are adding features, that larger maintenance phase can be easier and raise our quality of life. From a high level, some types of architectures are the no architecture approach. Typically, young teams of individuals who are getting into software will do what feels right in the moment without some larger perspective or vision for the project. But Ultimately, we'll see uh, we need something else. Uh, veteran teams uh, can use custom architectural solutions where they look at the unique needs of a team and the product that they're creating, employing a library of uh, those uh, principles and patterns and create uh, their own solution. There are pros and cons to this approach and uh, another key type is using an established architecture, something we can pull off the shelf and apply in a pers prescriptive manner to our projects. These include MVP uh, and MVC and MVVM, and uh, there's many, many more. Uh, we'll look at the details of uh, these. So while it feels quite natural to just develop as we go and do what feels in the right moment, this no architecture approach has drawbacks. Whether you're an individual or on a small team, there will be more debate on how to add each feature since you don't have a recipe. That leads to inconsistencies over the life of one developer and across each other developer of the team. That means applying refactors becomes more challenging because there's all subtle variations in the code base. It becomes much more difficult to read the code one day later, one week later, or one year later. And when you're bringing new team members on or taking uh, team members off of the project, it's more labor intensive. You have to do more custom explanations. The new dev needs to uh, spend more time to understand what's there and the code base. And each time a developer departs, they have to explain and document more of their custom personal flavor on how they applied that to the project. Now, to many devs, particularly beginners, this approach might still feel like the fastest way to get your features across. 
And often we see developers in prototype phases throw these rules out the window and do the no architecture approach. However, such fast code does indeed bring more bugs and complexity to the project. And the cost of software bugs grows exponentially over time. If you can catch bugs earlier, it's quicker to fix uh, and has less of an impact on your overall project. Research shows that if you can catch uh, that same bug after uh, you've uh, shipped the product, it can be 30 times or more difficult to fix that bug and get that new version out. So best practices are to create maintainable code from the beginning to increase automation and any testing around it, which we'll talk about later to catch those bugs early and often. And to fix all of your bugs before you move on uh, to making new features. Software research shows that more than 80% of bugs happens with around 20% of functionality. These can be the core pieces of glue or the architecture that holds everything together. Working quickly to add new features for the architecture or the no architecture approach will cause more and more problems over there. Also, quite surprising to many, over 80% of the life of developers on a software project, that 80% is maintaining the code base, not necessarily adding new features. So while we think that all day is adding features, it's quite a small part of the overall workload. So a key takeaway here is to do that 20% of the new functionality and features in an efficient long-term methodology. So that when we are spending the time maintaining the code base, we recap those benefits. Together, we'll see that using established architecture like MVC will bring us many benefits in our uh, Unity development. Let's take a closer look at some of the established architectures we can choose from and see benefits of MVC. Several different approaches are possible when making a Unity game. As part of an exploration on this topic, let's talk about a simple 3D Unity bowling game from scratch using six different styles, each style focused on a particular architecture. We'll see some of them listed here. Started from the top, it's more of what feels natural to a beginning developer. I call this the no architecture approach. And the flavor you see in Unity is when you put code local to the 3D object it relates to. So you'd put bowling ball code on the bowling ball, you'd put pin code on the pin. When learning Unity, this feels like a natural way to do it. One of the problems that arises uh, is how do you get those different 3D objects with their separate code? to talk well together. Moving forward, probably someone with a bit more experience would realize that having most of their code off on a separate empty game object somewhere with references to the pins and references to the bowling ball would be a next step up. This smooths out some uh, communication because that empty game object can facilitate a possible problem here with uh, this is that uh, that empty game object doesn't know the exact life cycle of each of the objects. It may uh, have problems starting up the world, pausing and unpausing gameplay, and knowing when elements have been destroyed. A veteran developer or small team making this game may try a custom architecture. They'll use the good design principles and the design patterns that they've learned and uh, apply them to some custom solution. The benefits uh, that uh, are that it's very flexible. It uh, does require a lot of 
a lot more knowledge and experience to be able to create such a solution. And uh, problems that arise uh, there include that you're reinventing the wheel for every project. Fair enough. That uh, wheel is customized to each solution. But if you're maintaining multiple projects, it can be a bit more difficult to step up in and out uh, of each one of them. And when hiring new staff, you need to educate them on your particular flavor or of architectural solution per project. Finally, there's using an established solution, taking a solution off the shelf and applying it to the project has lots of benefits. We know uh, it's been proven. We know it's built on top of principles and patterns that work. However, it is less flexible and can be seen as verbose. Maybe needing to add multiple classes uh, or quite a bit of code to accomplish simple things, especially in the early days of development. And uh, also each uh, member of uh, your team and uh, anybody new that joins uh, needs to know that particular framework. Now, in one way, that's easier because there's existing materials. They may already have the skills for a particular established framework that you choose, but that's a learning curve is uh, notable. Now, after decades of software development, many of architectures that uh, we see today have stood the test of time. Some very popular ones include breaking the core functionality into three or four separate pieces and having those pieces communicate. The general idea is that each of them solves challenges that have specific needs. So it makes sense to group them. Uh, some of the established architectures we know uh, about are uh, model view presenter, model view view model, and a model view controller or MVC. Model view presenter organizes the code into three distinct units. The presenter sits in the middle and organizes uh, and coordinates the other tiers. In this case, the presenter receives input from the user primarily. The presenter will coordinate the rendering out with the view. And when you have a high amount of user interaction and frequently updated views, this is one great solution. The model view view model is quite similar. It's separated into three concerns or three areas of code. And here, the view model sits in the middle. The view model handles the input and coordinates the rendering with the view. And it's also ideal when there's user interaction and frequent updates to the view. And MVC looks quite similar. Here we have a controller as the middle object in strict MVC, it's uh, the controller that handles the input. In uh, coordinates, uh, pulling data from uh, the model, passing on what is needed to render out the view. And it's ideal when you have multiple models and multiple views to coordinate that complexity. Ultimately, this set of established architectures are quite similar. They all seek out to separate the concerns of your project to help improve the overall quality of life while working and maintaining on the project. Quite crucially, they separate out the UI or view from the data. Now, the differences here are quite subtle. Of course, we have the naming uh, is a bit different, but also the behaviors, which we'd only really see at uh, the implementation level, are unique to each of them as well. For now, let's take a deeper look at MVC. We'll choose that uh, as our favorite of these patterns and move forward. 
Model view controller is an architecture that separates your code out into those three primary concerns. To recap, the model handles the runtime data, the view handles the UI and uh, the input from the user, also rendering out audio visuals to the user as well. And uh, the controller is the glue. It sits between everything, coordinates things, and has the high level game logic. Now, special note here is that MVC typically has the controller manage the input from the user. In our approach, we have the view handle the input. That's a subtle difference that has to do with how Unity relates with input in a traditional sense. Often we think of the view being mono behaviors. Mono behaviors help handle input, so it's a good fit. So a slight variation here is that we'll have the view handle the input and pass that on to the controller to actually process and decide what that means. Today's modern games are often connected to backend services or even multiplayer with uh, other players live. This introduces a service layer. So let's take that. Uh, uh, let's take what we've discussed uh, with MVC and add one more layer, a dedicated service layer that will deal with external data. That's different than the model. Now, using um, now, now during the rest of this presentation, I may use MVC and MVCS interchangeably. I mean them to be the same solution, the same basic plan with maybe there's a service layer or maybe there's not, depending if your game needs it. If you can consider uh, that uh, layer optional. Overall, using an MVC uh, established architecture has many features and benefits. Established architectures are proven built uh, on uh, those principles and patterns we've uh, seen with success. They're language agnostic, so in theory, you could port them to different languages and platforms if uh, your workload expands to different technologies. Now, while there is a learning curve, ultimately using an architecture like this leads to faster development. And because we've seen the, the gross majority of the lifespan of a project uh, is spent in the maintenance, we will see uh, uh, that we will really be able to uh, do that maintenance more quickly and more efficiently within architecture. Furthermore, an MVCS project is more readable, more testable, more decoupled in how these different concerns communicate. We have that the dedicated service layer if we need it on our project, which quite often we do. And there's workflow benefits as well. As our project all sit on version control and we collaborate by committing to version control, we'll see less friction of commits when we use an established architecture, purely because it separates our code base out into smaller snippets and that means that there's less probability of conflicts. Now, it's worth noting that there is healthy debate, particularly in game development and uh, the Unity community, against using something like MVC. A few popular arguments are that it's too rigid, that this is challenging to follow and apply and have the discipline into your project. Now, a response uh, in defense of MVC is that uh, that learning curve is worth the effort. Furthermore, I mentioned that uh, in the mind of developers, we often think that life is all about adding features and we forget that real significant stage of maintenance. So here, it may feel easier to use something else, but MVC ultimately creates better workflow. Another argument is that Unity itself 
doesn't feature data binding. And without data binding, we can't establish the patterns of architecture that are meant for MVC. While certainly using data binding can make it easier to apply this, there's alternative solutions and we'll see some of those. In particular, the observable class uh, is uh, how we're going to solve that within our architecture. Here we get something like binding pretty easy off the shelf. Another comment is that because the communication is decoupled and passes through more steps, that using an established ar architecture like MVC is not optimized. And we know that gaming is a type of software that needs optimization. I could not agree more with this assessment. However, I would say that the bulk of your work as a team is not necessarily on the narrow parts of capturing input and uh, rendering graphics. One simple way to address this is to have the larger metagame on, of your menus, your social features, high score tables, inventory management, all the complexity to UI have that sit within an established framework. And your core gameplay, which needs the benefits of a highly optimized pipeline that could sit outside of MVC communicating in a more decoupled, uh, more coupled, sorry, and uh, more a quick fashion. That's uh, an excellent hybrid solution. And uh, finally, there's uh, a criticism that using an established architecture means that every new button you add that you have to wire up. It's too verbose. There's uh, too many steps involved, too many classes to create. We'll see a little bit more on that uh, in a future slide. I'd say that's true. Uh, you need to have around four or five steps instead of two or three steps to wire UI into your game in that specific example. Especially in the beginning, doing a couple extra steps can feel tedious, but ultimately this is a symptom of the benefit of separating your concerns out. During the initial 20% of adding features, you will feel this and it takes some getting used to. But the benefits really apply to that larger 80% of maintaining that code base. Now that uh, things are laid out quite separately, you'll find that refactors happen with more confidence, bugs are less likely to occur, and when they occur, solving them is more easy and straightforward. Some reference uh, links will be uh, included here. Uh, if you want to learn a bit more about uh, the perspective, you can take a look and I encourage you to do so. Overall, each software development tool has pros and cons. I demonstrate in this presentation that learning an established ar architecture like MVC has benefits that outweigh those drawbacks. Let's learn more. MVCS starts with the separation of concerns. Let's recap. The model handles the runtime data. The controller sits in the middle and coordinates co communication. It also contains most of the game logic. The view handles the UI and uh, input from the user, as well as rendering out graphics and audio. And the service layer handles any external data calls. For example, if uh, your game collaborates with a backend system for submitting high scores. The conventions of using MVCS are to be vigilant with references and communication between your concerns. You want to keep those concerns separate. The idea is that each concern is basically meant to do very different things. And so you want to isolate those changes. 
take a look at this communication table. There's a lot of information there, but the main takeaway is that the controller sends and receives most of the communication. We want the model to be pretty dumb, knowing only data about uh, data stuff. Uh, we want the view itself to be pretty dumb, handling only UI and input stuff. The fact that they don't openly communicate directly with each other is a plus. And for most communications, we see that the service behaves like the model. It uh, too is meant to be dumb and handle just its own data. Now, when getting new into one of these, now when beginning to learn an established architecture like MVCS, MVCS offers some flexibility in how you communicate with the different concerns. A first reaction when people are getting into an established framework is, wow, it's verbose. I need to do quite a bit of steps in order to accomplish something as simple as a UI button click. Let's see the range of complexity here. First, if we had a no architecture approach and we were not using MVCS, how would we listen to a button? Imagine if we have a click the button game and by clicking the button, the next uh, the, te the text updates to you win. This is a very simple game. We could uh, get uh, away with two steps to the process. Assuming we're using Unity UI, we would listen to the on-click event on that UI, and we would handle that with some custom code. That's two steps. Now, using an established architecture like MVCS, we see that it's going to take some more steps. This is because these concerns have been separated out. In the most verbose of favor, we'll see about five steps to handle that button click. That's the view button sending out a message, the controller handling it, updating the model, the model passing out a message. Hey, I've been updated and the view getting that information so that uh, it can update the view itself. You also see uh, in this uh, list, I interchange whether an event is used or a command. Ultimately, what I'd recommend to teams is to choose one of these flavors and just go with it. For example, consistently applying the number five for the beginning of your development. Get a feel for that. If you do want to shorten the process from five to four or some other amount of steps, that's up to you to decide. But remember being consistent in your approach and more decoupled in your approach uh, pays dividends. Now, it uh, can be a little confusing that we have some parts of this process uh, are prescripting, pre prescriptive uh, that we must uh, follow. And there's also flexibility like these different choices. As you're getting used to uh, using MVCS, I'd say, don't worry too much about getting it perfect. It's all a learning process. And along the way, you'll see which flavor works best for you. Another bonus about this is later in the project. If you decide that you want to change your approach, it's going to be much easier to refactor within MVCS than prior. Even if you have some subtle differences to how you've applied it, the patterns themselves uh, provide a consistency that was maybe missing from your previous approaches. For the purposes of our discussion, we are going to elect the MVC or MVCS as our favorite solution to move forward and see how it applies to Unity to get a good feel for it. Now, 
A special note about why MVC solutions need to be massaged a bit when you bring them into the Unity world is that Uh, it's important to note that Unity itself is not uh, built uh, on an MVC structure. Uh, it has areas of concern that collapse these into one area. For example, probably the single most important class that uh, you utilize in any Unity project is mono behavior. Particularly as a, a beginning developer, Everything you do sits on a subclass of mono behavior. Just using mono behavior in an example, we can see that Unity collapses lots of different concerns there. It behaves somewhat like a model, having properties like enabled tag and transform. It behaves something like a view doing all sorts of input loops and uh, graphics uh, rendering from within inside the mono behavior lifecycle. And it behaves something like a controller. It uh, has moments if you can capture predictability uh, for uh, awake, start, update, many, many more. It uh, has the concept of serialized reference, which helps you address and to reach different concerns you may have outside of the mono behavior. Unity, like any specific platform, has unique features. And uh, we have to bring these theoretical concepts of architecture into the real world of Unity. I'm uh, leaving here uh, references to some resources uh, so you can take a look uh, at including uh, the execution uh, order of uh, all the different uh, events uh, mono behavior has. And then of course, the documentation script uh, reference for mono behavior itself. Now, as we are thinking of uh, any architecture and bring uh, it into Unity, uh, or if we are creating a custom solution ourselves, there are some considerations. Does the framework or architecture have Unity specific features? What's the role of mono behaviors? Uh, they are so important in the Unity world, but come with some pros and cons. Does the architecture use mono behaviors? How does the architecture handle different concerns and communication between those concerns? And speaking of that, what's the level of rigidity versus flexibility? Overall, in this section, we talked about architectures. We saw the pros and cons of using any given established architecture. We talked about some of the differences in key established architectures we can choose from. We saw drawbacks of using no architecture approach. While that feels very natural, especially as a beginner, it ultimately doesn't pay dividends. So now I, I would like to uh, show you uh, the code example. Uh, I was thinking about something really simple and uh, thought that I could make a clock uh, using uh, the MVC uh, architecture uh, with uh, even with faking the service layer. So uh, I don't know if you see the screen. Uh, yeah, we can see it. Okay. So the idea is that uh, we have uh, the clock that uh, takes uh, some amount of uh, uh, for example, every uh, every one second. But uh, let's let's do it in 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 two approaches. First, I will do it in uh, in the approach uh, of uh, no architecture, and uh, then uh, we will do it with uh, with the MVCS. Okay. So let's. Oh, 
let's let's do it. So here I will create script uh, clock without uh, well, no architecture. So now we have something like that. We have Clock tick. So we will have some kind of counter. Okay, and we will do simple debug log. Of So, uh, and we can go with Guys, is it a uh, normal uh, size or maybe Michal should uh, should a bit bigger? Yeah, t tell me if you see uh, the code, if, if it's uh, the appropriate size for you. Silence. <laughs> okay. Silence. Okay. <laughs> I will delete this one because it's for the other example. Um, clock. So we go with this one. And if I am not mistaken, when I press play, I should have the clock tick. Yeah. So this is the no architecture approach. So for such simple solution, uh, for for such a simple problem, uh, this may uh, seem uh, intuitive to do it that way. But let's see uh, how uh, 
does it uh, look uh, in comparison to uh, the MVCS? So the amount of code for MVCS apparently is so uh, significant that uh, I have uh, written uh, it uh, beforehand. So I will instead just show you uh, what's going on here. Uh, and uh, then I will uh, make a test if it if it's working uh, for, for the uh, Unity game. So we do have uh, clock with mini. Uh, I will explain why it's mini. Uh, there are several possible approaches uh, to uh, implement uh, MVC pattern. And uh, the regular one would uh, include uh, the model, view, controller, and uh, service all sit on top of uh, mono behaviors. That would be the regular uh, approach. But if we, for some reason, want to uh, be, let's say, free of uh, of the dependency uh, to uh, to the mono behavior, uh, then uh, we want uh, this entire uh, architecture to be uh, made in, uh, let's say, non-Unity classes. Uh, th this uh, is uh, maybe because uh, Mono Behavior also has its own uh, overhead that uh, gives uh, to, to, to Unity. So instead of using many Mono Behavior, it's better to have, let's say, one uh, object that is mono behavior that will let's say run uh, all this uh, architecture uh, in a single let's say snatch. Uh, so we are uh, having this mini uh, here, which in uh, which is initialized in the start, and then we can forget about that. But what happens under the hood is as follows. I have this structure that uh, holds uh, all uh, context, model, view, controller, service. I'm initializing it all. Uh, and for this uh, particular uh, example, uh, I have concrete. Uh, OK, so I, I have concrete classes. So uh, this is, a, let's say, ready package for that. And uh, every single uh, one of uh, these uh, is going to be a part of that. So let's start with context. Uh, or maybe, sorry, maybe with me, mini MVCS. So uh, this is the level of, of abstraction that uh, we are giving. So it can be applied not just to the clock. So we have a, a generic type for a context model, view, controller, and service, uh, which uh, would be nice if uh, inherited uh, from particular types. Uh, we uh, initialize them, and uh, the interfaces that are provided here uh, mostly uh, do just that. Uh, they, are, they inherit from iConcern. I iConcern I inherits from uh, I initializable with context. And I initializable with context is responsible that uh, there will be uh, the initial initialization uh, logic. So let's go back. We have the context now. So the context has uh, the model locator, has the uh, command uh, manager. Uh, and uh, these things, uh, let's say, are uh, to, well, get the, uh, the the context of what's inside from, from outside of uh, this package. So. Uh, that we are able to communicate, for example, between multiple uh, multiple such uh, packages or something like that. I'm not going to dive uh, into uh, model locator, but uh, let's go to the command manager. So 
the uh, command manager has uh, the collection of uh, delegates that uh, are going to be, let's say, fired when uh, when uh, the, there's the event uh, from the uh, appropriate uh, appropriate uh, segment of uh, of the MVCS. We can invoke a command. We can uh, execute command. We can undo command. O of course, we can uh, add command listener. And uh, we can uh, undo command listener. So this is like register, unregister. Uh, and remove a command uh, listener. OK, so now that we have that, we also can go to the model. So the clock model derives from base model. Base model derives from I model. I model derives from I concern. I concern derives from uh, I initializable with context. So uh, it's all the same here. And uh, the model uh, has the context and uh, has the information if it's uh, initialized. The clock model, though, is a concrete uh, type and it stores our uh, time value and uh, time uh, delay value. Time value is, of course, what is uh, what we uh, print on the debug log. And time delay value is when we uh, start to uh, printing it, because uh, we are faking uh, here the service layer. So we uh, need uh, some, let's say, fraction of time to, uh, let's say, connect to, to the service. OK, let's return. Let's go to the view. Our view, uh, same as the model, uh, maybe OK. View doesn't have a base view, because uh, that would not uh, make any sense, but it uh, inherits from I view. So uh, our uh, clock view uh, is uh, something very simple, because uh, we just uh, have the simple debug log here when uh, there's uh, an on time changed command uh, fired. Let's go back. We have the, uh, I will go to the service and then to the controller because the controller is the glue of everything. Our controller uh, inherits from base service. Did I say controller? Our service derives from the base service base service from i service and further we know how it is so uh, it looks very simple as uh, the other module and uh, our clock service uh, it has initialize it has load load async so here we uh, fake uh, the um, info coming from let's say externally uh, for, for that, we are uh, parsing uh, the text file, reading how much delay exactly we are getting from there. And uh, then uh, after we get that value, we fire the, uh, we invoke the unloaded, uh, unloaded uh, event. And let's go back to the controller now. Our controller uh, stores uh, all three model view service. It has the initialize. It derives from base controller, which in a similar manner, but uh, in this case uh, more uh, advanced, is doing same stuff because uh, it's instead of one thing, it initializes three things. It has initialize. Uh, then uh, adds listener to uh, on value changed in the time model. 
it adds listener to uh, unloaded in service. And uh, when everything in is initialized, it loads the service. Then, when uh, service unloaded, it uh, checks if it's initialized, otherwise it will throw an exception. And if uh, everything is fine, it applies uh, to the model the time delay from the service and it starts ticking. When it starts ticking, we have start ticking method. Uh, we round uh, the time amount uh, we, we have uh, received to full seconds and uh, we do a task uh, sorry, we, we change uh, the value time in the model, uh, which then a model uh, gives us back the model on timer changed. And uh, we make a delay for another tick. So this is pretty much it. And uh, let's go back to Unity. Create empty block with uh, mini. Let's apply the script clock with mini. And as we see, it does the same thing with uh, the decoupled structure. So going back to the presentation, uh, for this presentation, uh, I've uh, used the Unity docs. The refactoring guru, uh, it would be uh, visible if uh, you see the first parts of the presentation. And uh, great kudos to uh, RMC uh, for making an awesome course uh, based on which uh, I was able to show you what uh, I have uh, shown. Do you have any questions? <laughs>